Once again, good morning. It's good to see everyone this morning. Take your Bibles and open with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. We are diving into the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. Lord, as we open your word, open our hearts to hear from you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Last week, we looked at the Beatitudes. We're going to pick up in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 5. The verse starts with these words. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt had lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. When we think about these words, they evoke the image and the idea of a loss of usefulness. A loss of usefulness. Have you ever seen salt that maybe it got moist in the container or maybe uh, whatever happened or atmosphere, humidity, and it gets all clumped up and loses its taste? And just kind of dump it out. It's not really good for seasoning anything anymore. So right off the bat as we dig in to the Sermon on the Mount. And we've looked at the, the Beatitudes. And, and right off the bat Jesus begins to deal with this reality of loss of usefulness. In the individual's life. He is speaking particularly in context to the people of Israel, and he's speaking to them, and he's sharing this analogy, and he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt's lost its savor, is there any real use for it? Friends, we're dealing with the loss that we face as individuals as the consequences of sin. Because Sin causes us to lose our usefulness to God's purposes. Sin gets all in the way of it. <clears throat> I want you to read on. If you pick back up in verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Well, we live right on the corner of a busy road in a, in a packed neighborhood. And you wouldn't believe the people that stop and observe things about my place. <laughs> It don't seem that interesting to me, but strangers will stop and say, hey, did you know this is in your yard or this? Uh, we've been watching your dogs or, you know, and uh, that's the strangest thing. They love my dogs. People stop by and pet my dogs. I'm thinking, don't pet my dogs. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> but Jesus says, you're the line of the world, a city that is set on a hill. It cannot be hid. You've seen at night. Those houses that sit on the prominent place in the town or in, even in the country. And, and I've been on some, some country roads out in the cold winter and it'd be so snowy and dark and you think, boy, this is, there's nothing out here. And then way off in the distance you see an old house just shining some light. You say, well, somebody lives here. Verse 15, neither do men light a candle. And put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify 
your Father which is in heaven. When we look at Romans chapter 3 and, and verse 23 in the Romans road, we literally see that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now we're talking about usefulness in God's purposes, God's kingdom. And sin renders uh, us in ourselves unuseless to His purposes. And when we talk about being light, the same analogy, shining forth righteousness, and it says for the purpose of God's glory, let me give you a definition of sin. Sin is coming short of God's glory. Sin is coming short of God's purposes in our life. Sin is coming short of the mark of God's designed righteous purposes for you as an individual and for us as people in the world. Sin is to fall short of bringing God glory in our lives and in our choices. And it is a reality that we face because the Bible has rendered all have sinned and come short of the glory. And Jesus is starting out very harsh. Salt without flavor is not useful. People are meant to give light to the world and bring God glory. But yet, there is that inability within ourselves because of sin to bring God glory with our lives. Now let's move on. Many scholars think about the Sermon on the Mount that perhaps it was specific for the people of the past. That is, for the nation of Israel, for the context that Jesus lived in. And they relegated primarily to that setting. Well, the challenge with that is as you get towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, He's not talking so much about the law and the, and the people of the law as He is in the beginning as he is the future kingdom. And so that leads some to believe that, no, he's not talking about the past covenant with Israel, but he's talking about the future covenant in the kingdom. But I believe he's talking about universal principles of kingdom morality. That is, God's got a purpose in people. God wants to be glorified in his creation. God wants to be glorified in our lives, in our choices. And what we see right off the bat is there's a coming short of those purposes of God in our lives. There's a coming short of that glory. And then we see the reality of the law at work. Look at verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy the law but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. I want to ask you the question, friend. Who's going to fulfill it? As we read this, we seems and it should be that the intent is that we fulfill it. But if you listen to the words of Christ and you realize the reality of our own context and setting and our own shortcomings and failures to bring God glory, and you look at that statement and he says these words, I have not come to do away with the law, to destroy the law, but I've come to fulfill the law. Who's going to fulfill it, friend? Not one 
jot. Not one tittle of the law of God went unfulfilled in the life, in the person, in the testimony of Jesus Christ. In fact, had he broken God's holy law in his life and dedication, one little line had went unfulfilled, the universe would come unglued. You said, oh, you're exaggerating, Brother Micah. Oh, no, I'm not. The Bible says that the world is held together. The cosmos, everything consists and is held together, kept by the word of his power. When Jesus walked in flesh and blood on this world, he walked in perfection, keeping, fulfilling the holy requirements of God, where you and I fail, where Israel failed, where all the world comes short of bringing God glory, there was one who could keep it. And his mission was a mission of fulfilling the law all the way to the smallest mark. Wow. Wow. You think God expects a lot out of you, friend. You think God expects a lot out of me. Imagine the entire weight of fulfilling God's holy requirement riding on your shoulders. We're going to get into that a little bit more. Verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach man so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. When we look at the Scriptures, we see the law is exacting. It has specific demands that must be met. And without the meeting of those demands, there is a breaking of the law. It's an exacting law. If you look at James chapter 2, turn with me. Chapter 2 and verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. That is, he's a lawbreaker. Jesus is teaching about absolute righteousness, about kingdom morality. And he's telling them, you know, the salt loses its taste. It's not useful that you're meant to be a light showing glory to God with your choices. And then he goes on and says that those that break the law, even the little aspects of it, they're not great in God's kingdom. Those that teach them and promote them and keep them, they're the ones considered great. And it leaves you pondering. Whew. You know, I know there are bigger sins and littler sins there are some things the law holds in greater penalty than others. Not everything in the law was a death penalty. Some things you could make sacrifice for. Some things you could not. 
So there are sins that are more heinous, more devastating, that have more condemnation upon them. But in reality, what James is speaking of, when he says if you've offended one point, you're guilty of the entirety of, of the law and what the Apostle Paul was talking about when he said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God is that the reality is when you're under the offense of the law, you're outside of God's law. And it doesn't matter if you're way outside it or you're just outside the line, you're still standing outside of the righteousness of God's holy requirements for morality. And when you stand outside the law, you stand in condemnation of the law. It don't matter if you're way out there or if you're right there. It'd be terrible to miss the kingdom by that much. Harmony is sin. To miss the mark. If you're shooting an arrow at a target, especially a deer, don't matter if you miss it by an inch or you miss it by a mile, that deer's skipping off. So is reality when it comes to our own righteousness and our own ability to glorify God with our lives. So is reality when it comes to our spiritual condition before God. So is reality when it comes to our very standing in God's presence. We are as individuals finding ourselves in a very peculiar position because even if we've offended greatly or we've offended on a small scale, we still failed to glorify God and that is the very purpose for which we as people are created. Oh, then he goes on. And he looks down at the crowd. They're all seated. They're all gathered. Thousands of them. A mixed bunch. Some poor folks. Some wealthy folks. Some heathen sinning folks. That knew better. Grew up in good homes. But went astray. Some righteous. Noble people. I believe he looks over at the Pharisees that had came to hear him speak. I believe he looks over at the teachers of the law, which would be the preachers and the rabbis of the day. And they look distinct from the rest of the people because they've used an exacting formula for righteousness. And they strived in their lives to be separated and to be different. And so they looked at them, they, they look different. They've got a special robe that distinguishes them. They've got special scriptures and markings. They've got their hair cut a certain way. They've got their decorations all right. They've been schooled under the great teachers. They paid their dues. They paid their tithes. They're invested. They are set. They are legit. And they stand as an example to the rest of the community and all these thousands of people in this Jewish ethnic community. They stand and they look as they got it all together. And everybody else looks at them as those that set the standard for righteousness. I believe Jesus looks dead at them. All through the multitude, just pinning them out. And then He says these words. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. With one statement, with one swing, with one word, it was at that precise moment, liberating and terrifying. 
I guarantee you that the audience that heard that statement, they had both those emotions overwhelm them at once. At first, they felt a little bit liberated because the Pharisees were the taskmasters of righteousness. Do this. Don't do that. Taste not. Touch not. Keep yourself clean. Keep yourself pure. They're watching. You're keeping up their standard or you're outside of their judgment of righteousness. And they stood as the judges of the people and as the standard. And they were the taskmasters of righteousness. And they showed themselves to be the example. And so, as they are looked upon as the very epitome, the masters of righteousness, those that hold it in truth and sincerity, those that set it forth the way the law should be followed and believed and practiced, those that were the example for all those that could only look on and wish they could be like these. And Jesus looks at the multitude, especially the Pharisees, and He says, except your righteousness exceed theirs, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And everybody that's been looking on under their heavy oppression, under their hard requirements, under their rigorous discipline, they thought, well, at least he's in the same boat we are. But then with the second swing of the pendulum, the thought comes back across the mind. It's funny how that works. One thought leads to another in a chain of thinking. First they thought, well, those guys are in the same position we're in. Good for them. But the second thought is, if they can't make it to the kingdom, who can? If they with their rigorous discipline, if they with their lives of devotion, if they with their, all their show and pomp and all that they do in religious vigor, if they're not fit for the kingdom, woe unto us. Peter said about the Lord's return, <laughs> judgment first begins in the house of God. He said, but if the righteous scarcely be saved, what of the ungodly? And we see this about the Pharisees and Jesus pronouncing them unfit for the kingdom. And everybody's looking on like, what? If they can't make it into the kingdom, who can? Who's fit? Who's going to see it? Who's going to make it? Who's going to have the right and the privilege to be there? Well, <clears throat> I'm thinking about Isaiah. Chapter 64 and verse 6. And Jesus says, or the prophet Isaiah says these words. He says, all our righteousness, not our bad deeds, not our failures and our mistakes, not, not, the, not the good that we intended and tried to do, but all our righteousness. It's filthy rags before God. Because it all comes short. And it's all tainted with sin. And it all fails to bring Him glory. And you say, well, who can feel this holy demand for righteousness? Not me. Not you. Not the Pharisees. Not the scribes. Certainly not the poor sinners that was listening on the mountain that day. 
But there's only one who is ever able in and of themselves to meet and to fulfill the righteous requirements of God. Do you know our best attempts at conformity to God's law at best is hypocrisy? But there is one who in himself is the complete satisfaction and fulfillment of God's holy law. I want you to look at a few verses with me. And I won't get long. I'll flip fast. Acts chapter 3. Verse 14. Speaking of Jesus in this great sermon Peter puts forward. But ye denied the Holy One, and the just. And you desire the murderer to be granted unto you. And you killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath this man been made strong. I want you to see that Jesus is referenced as the Holy One, and the just one. And I want you to notice one. There's no other. Throughout the book of Acts, he's referred to as that. The holy one, the just one. Romans 5 and verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. This is what you've got to catch. So by the obedience of one, many shall be made righteous. John, his letter, 1 John First John chapter 2. Verse 1. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ. And look at that. The righteous. The righteous. Back to Romans chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 21 through 26. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Romans 10 and verse 4 tells us that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Philippians 3 and verse 9, the Apostle Paul telling us his own life desire and ambition. He says these words, that I may know him. Oh, friends, that I might be found 
in Him. Not having mine own righteousness, which is by the law, but the righteousness which is through faith in Jesus. Friends, you know something? When we start out into our venture through the Sermon on the Mount, one thing right off the bat becomes so apparently clear that this standard of righteousness set forth by Jesus is beyond our grasp. This is a holiness that even our own consciences testify in our minds, in our abilities, is impossible. The law was hard enough. And we couldn't keep it. Jesus' standard supersedes the law. Fulfills the law, completes the law, and goes even beyond the law. Dealing with intents and motives. And we're going to get into that. This is the divine standard of morality set forward in Christ. But one thing right off the bat that becomes so apparent is how far outside that morality even you and I who would and intend stand apart from it. There's a need. There's a need in each of our souls for righteousness that supersedes the righteousness of the law. There's a need in us for righteousness that is beyond our own grasp and ability to obtain. There's a need for the righteousness of Christ. And that need is provided in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Himself. Through the substitution, when He died in our place on the cross, bearing our sins, bearing our shame, putting it away from us, putting it to death, and through the power of God that raised Him to new life, and through faith in His work of atonement, and the power that raised Him, and in that sacred and holy name, when we believe on Jesus, His righteousness is accounted to you and I in desperate need of divine righteousness is put on our accounts. I'm going to ask you to stand. This morning, church, maybe you're feeling pretty short of the glory of God in your life. Maybe there's a failure. Maybe there's a struggle you're facing. You don't know how you can overcome. You don't know how you can get beyond it. There's power in the atonement. You're wondering how you can have a relationship with a holy God. Being the sinner that you are. There's power in the resurrection. God has a purpose in the standard and a plan. And He wants each of us to fulfill His righteousness in our lives. But the Bible says that we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The works aren't ours. They never were. They're His good works. And they're accomplished in us when we begin to believe that Jesus has satisfied God's righteousness on our behalf. And then we begin to embrace all that He is and all that He has for us. 
Maybe you're here. And you're struggling in your soul. And God is calling you to let go of your own righteousness and to receive the righteousness that Christ has provided through faith. If that's you, this is your morning. As we play, as we sing, if God's moving your heart, you come to Jesus. Friend, the kingdom is real. And it's available. But you're not going to earn it. He's earned it for you. Will you believe?